Today, we're going to explore the world of MPH applications, admissions, and funding um, at the number one ranked School of Public Health. Um, I understand that most of us uh, prospective students and applicants um, would love to gain admission and several other tips on how to go through this process. So today, as usual, on this platform, I will help provide you with the knowledge and information that you need in order to navigate this process with confidence. Uh, for many of us, pursuing graduate school, uh, it's a crucial step towards our aspirations and realization of our potential. Uh, if, if you are new to this uh, table, uh, the program is also streaming on YouTube, Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Uh, you can leave your comments and questions in the comment section, and we'll try our best to answer all of them. Um, today, we are very honored um, to have uh, uh, students' favorite professor and program chair, uh, Professor Marodina West, uh, who is Helena B. Uh, Margaret Morell, Professorship and Master of Public Health Program Chair. Uh, she has received numerous awards, including the Bloomberg's uh, Bloomberg School's Golden Apple Award. Uh, she's re received this four times, which is usually given to exceptional teachers uh, each year by students. Uh, she's well known for her excellence in teaching and mentoring students. Um, she will share with us today her experiences and insights about the MPH application, um, admission, and funding. Um, uh, she provided with valuable tips and advice drawn from her extensive experience as faculty and chair of the program. Uh, without wasting much time, uh, let me invite Professor Barry Dida West. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Banda. It's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be here with all of you. I can see the comments in the guest chat. I can't see any, see any of your faces, but I know, <laughs> know that you're there. Yes. So, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to... Um, to talk to you about both the MPH and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'll just start by saying that I um, am a product of the School of Public Health. I have a PhD in biostatistics from the school, I'll say a number of decades ago. And, um, and one of the reasons I think that our school is number one, is the you know, number one school of public health is the people. Um, mm -hmm. So I've stayed around a very long time um, and my husband as well. My husband has an MPH and a DRPH from the school, and he never left. I left for three years, and I came back um, after being out. I came back. Um, it's the faculty and the students and the staff. It's a very collaborative um, environment. And I would say by far we're the most uh, internationally focused uh, mm -hmm. school, I think, of public health um, in the world. Um, so, you know, it's really the people that have made us number one. Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree. I, I, I think um, the first time I got to Hopkins, I was amazed at uh, how diverse uh, the community is, uh, from the faculty to students and the whole um, environment. I think it's, it's really um, a great place to be. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to be here with us today. Uh, we have over 80 people watching, a uh, couple on LinkedIn. Uh, we have almost 20 on YouTube. And then uh, we have a couple from Facebook. Um, if you're having uh, difficulty catching this uh, live, uh, you can check our YouTube channel. Uh, it's Dr. Banda Khalifa. It's also streaming. Um, let's, let's dive in. I know, uh, Professor, you don't have uh, much time. We, we only have one hour. So... We just dive into uh, some of the questions that we have. Um, so I, I guess you've 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 told us what really distinguishes uh, the Hopkins MPH from from others. Um, in in your in your experience being part of the admissions committee and being a faculty, what do you think are really the uh, the key criteria or the admission criteria uh, or the qualities that the program is looking out for in, in applicants? 
Well, great. That's a great question. And I think the first is that we are looking for individuals who have a passion for public health and who have had some experience um, and know a little bit, you know, where they want to go um, with that passion. So that's why we do require at least two years of post baccalaureate health experience. Mm -hmm. um, medical school does count, but for those who have bachelor's degrees, we do require at least two years. And our admissions committee is really taking a very holistic approach. We're looking not just at grades and GPA, though we are looking at evidence of success academically to ensure mm -hmm. that the student would be successful in our MPH, but we're really looking for their personal journey um, their personal statement tells us a lot about where they've been and where they hope to go. And then the letters of recommendation are really important because they should be written by individuals who know you and know you well and know your aspirations and your strengths. And so we look, um, I would say we weight all of those fairly equally, but we really place a lot of attention on the personal statement and the letters. Okay, so um, personal statement recommendation letters, and um, if you're coming in with a bachelor's, uh, you, you should have at least two years of uh, some form of experience. Right, some form of health-related experience. Health it doesn't related. need to be public health, but at least health full-time health-related experience, and that could mean working as a clinical research coordinator or working even as a laboratory technician mm -hmm. um, or um, working with a uh, nonprofit organization, um, any number uh, or a health department, any number of, of agencies or organizations. Okay, great. I think, I think that has been summed up pretty, pretty clear. Thank you so much for, for that uh, information. Um, I know like Hopkins have been in existence for a very long time. Um, can you share with us any recent developments or innovative initiatives uh, within the program? So within the MPH program mm -hmm. um, itself, um, we have, as many of the schools of public health, have met our accrediting bodies um, criteria. So the CEPH or Council on Education for Public Health actually um, had criteria that made us change our curriculum a bit. And I think it's actually been for the better. We require that all students now get an exposure, not just to quantitative methods, but qualitative, that mm -hmm. they have um, classes that teach them negotiation and mediation skills, classes that, um, that focus on health equity, mm -hmm. health advocacy, communication systems thinking. So we're not siloed anymore into epidemiology, health policy, um, management um, and environmental health. We actually have competencies that um, all students gain through our criteria uh, curriculum. So, um, so in terms of innovations in the program, we do have something called an MPH Field Experience Award that has been around for a while, but not for the hundred plus years that the school has existed, in which um, students can gain travel funds to work on um, and a practicum or applied learning experience um, during the winter break. Mm -hmm. um, that is one thing that we do have, especially in the 11 month full-time program. There's not a lot of time off yes. and that winter break, you know, can be useful um, for helping accomplish either a practicum, parts of a capstone or field experience. Um, but I would say that the most recent um, developments in our school that, of course, impact um, MPH students are we are the only school that has a Department of Mental Health. And mm -hmm. so we have quite a lot of uh, focus on both well wellness and mental health in the school. We, um, we recently um, have um, incorporated a new office that's called IDARE, but that, um, that acronym stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Anti-Racism, and, um, and Equity. And they are allowing us as a school to look through a different lens in how we teach our courses, our seminars, the um, you know inclusivity of all. I feel like we've done a pretty good job in the past, but we now have you know we have a formal um, a formal training in this, and um, and and we always have new centers. 
for students to align with in terms of uh, faculty and, and projects. And our Center for Native American Health has become now the Center for Indigenous Health, mm -hmm. which um, which um, which opens up yeah. right to opens up the category of um, of these uh, these needs. So, um, and then lastly, I would say another center that's relatively new is the Center for Health Security. Mm -hmm. And this was yeah. very prominent during the time of the, uh, the COVID mm -hmm. uh, pandemic. Yeah. The director was actually um, seconded, you know, seconded, if you will, to the government uh, to work with them. Amazing. So, you know, it's always an evolution. Yeah. Of different <laughs> yes. And uh, I mean, being away for just i think two years and coming back i've seen a lot of a lot of changes even in the in the mph curriculum itself it's so much yeah. has changed um and i and i feel it's 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 getting way better because it's now the the, the curriculum now encompasses a lot of competencies that at least even if you are not uh concentrating you you are sure to get um a very holistic view of what uh public health is um well, as, as usual, most of my listeners are international students, and I know a couple of students who have uh, gotten admission, um, and I know several others who are also preparing to put in the application for next cycle. Um, can you tell us any funding opportunities or scholarships available for international students? I know Hopkins is very generous when it comes to uh, scholarship for international students, but... Can you uh, give us a, a, a bit of uh, what goes into making those decisions for applicants? Sure. Thank you, Banda. So um, students do not need to apply separately for internal scholarships. Rather, the MPH Admissions Committee and their review for admissions passes um, records on to um, an MPH scholarship committee, and they will then review the application and rank them for um, for scholarships that might be SOMER scholars, which are full mm -hmm. tuition to possibly 75%, 50%, you know, 25% scholarships. Um, the thing that everyone should know is that the admissions letter comes first and the scholarship letter comes later. And mm -hmm. um, some schools do bundle those together, but, um, but in fact, um, ours are separate. So students are only beginning to hear um, um, about scholarships that have been awarded to them now. This will continue on a rolling basis mm -hmm. until the end of March. So I would recommend everyone to be a bit patient if you have applied. <laughs> um, but we also do encourage everyone to look at external scholarships. And so there is a listing that's on our financial aid. If you go to the um, public health um, jhu.edu website and just put in the search financial aid, you'll see that you can scroll down to types of financial aid, including public health grants that can be applied for. There, um, there are also listings at the ASPPH, the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health website. And if anyone wishes to um, email me, we also have an Excel file of funds, funding sources that mm -hmm. previous MPH students have applied for and gotten. And so those are those are ones that we encourage all students to look at as well. Great. Um, well, you've you've heard from uh, the program chair itself. Um, I told you to come with your notebooks because it's going to be <laughs> a session of a session with a lot of um, information for you to to keep. Um, so you've at least gotten an idea uh, about how the funding decisions are made. You don't have to apply separately for institutional funding. Your application uh, also serves as, uh, you know, your consideration for scholarship. So uh, you have to ensure that whatever application you're putting in, it's, it's, it's strong enough to be considered for scholarships. Um, thank you so much for that, for that information. Um, it's, are there like unique uh, partnerships or collaborations uh, that the school has with other organizations or other entities that are not within uh, the Bloomberg uh, uh, building. Right. And so that can be um, answered in different ways. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of um, partnerships with organizations um, in which students work with an organization or agency on their 
um, practicum or applied learning experience. So um, we can start local. We have over 100 community-based organizations in Baltimore that we partner with um, as a school. We also partner with um, some of the agencies or organizations in Washington, D.C. So we partner with um, health departments, you know, both locally um, in Baltimore mm -hmm. and then also have done so in D.C. Um, with some of the medical schools in D.C. in addition to the Johns Hopkins Medical School. Um, and we've um, had some students who've been interested in U.S. health policy. And so okay. it doesn't need to be um, a, a, a U.S. student, but an international student can actually um, do a health policy practicum with the, um, the House of Representatives in the state of Maryland in Annapolis. So um, those are some rather local. Um, we do have many connections of faculty who work with different um, countries and mm -hmm. different organizations like um, the World Bank, um, Gavi, um, mm -hmm. the um, uh, Global Alliance Group, um, you know, WHO. And so there are times when students are able to get um, these winter internships at such organizations. So those are ways in which there can be applied experience for a student who has um, who has come to Baltimore for the um, the MPH. I think the other is um, that we do have some partnerships with other universities, and um, so there is the Indian Institute of Health Management Research University, mm -hmm. IIHMRU, in which we actually have a um, a cooperative program in which students get a dual degree between that university and Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. Bloomberg School of Public Health, um, and they're based in Jaipur, um, India. So those are some of the international um, relationships we have as well. Great, great. Um, and, and I see like the community, it's, it's very um, far reaching. Um, and the moment you are you're 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 part of the community, you you are given the opportunity to reach out to as many people as possible that you would like to work with. Uh, so that I can attest to that fact. Um, so for international students, most of them would love to uh, get some um, experience after their program. Um, can you speak to the graduates' success in securing employment or perhaps furthering? Um, the education in public health. Um, I, uh, for me, I know like most of my mates that I completed with have secured employment, and most of the international students I know who graduated even this May, um, over ninety percent of them have gotten jobs. So just highlight a bit about how, uh, if there are any numbers you can share with us about the employment opportunities out there for for students at Ten Hopkins. Great, thank you, Banda. So I think that number you gave, that percentage of 90% is fairly accurate, both in talking about international students getting a, um, a job and on the, you know, an OPT position um, mm -hmm. after graduation. Typically it's not in June, it might be in July or August because, you know, it's a pretty intensive 11 month program. Yeah. So looking for that, um, that OPT position sometimes takes a while. Um, and the same is true of other students who are getting, getting jobs. I would say oh, across the board, 90% have jobs by September. And part of this is helped by our career services um, office. So we have um, a career services office that's become even more uh, even more active during the pandemic because mm -hmm. it's able to bring in so many other employers via Zoom. Um, every March, there's a very large career fair where um, students can talk with representatives from different um, companies, organizations, and agencies. Um, but now, uh, even in addition to that, there are many Zoom type of calls where students mm -hmm. can actually interview um, with different um, organizations, organizations throughout the year. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so that is, um, those are some of the ways in which um, students 
you know, do move forward. And then we do have sometimes students who decide they want to go on for a doctoral degree right away. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, case in point, Dr. Banda, you know, is in the <laughs> DRPH program, PhD, sorry, PhD, PhD yeah. in, in EPI. But, but we have two pathways. One is the DRPH program, yes. which is a part-time program, and then a PhD, which is full-time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for 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 sharing that um i know when uh, students reach out to me and say uh we've graduated we are not getting jobs i tell them eventually everyone gets jobs so just just <laughs> just calm just keep down looking. Right? Keep <laughs> yes looking. yes once you keep looking you eventually find one um so for for international students specifically um i know you've shared a couple of thoughts on how uh funding uh, mechanisms are, are done at Hopkins and the the other ways that they can they can assist. But the the, the issue is that the, I think because of the pandemic, a lot of institutions that used to offer funding to international students are all uh, withdrawing support. Um, how does the program, for example, assist international students in navigating? you know, the financial aid process or understanding the funding options available? So I think, um, again, there's two ways. One is that the MPH internal scholarships are distributed by the um, by the MPH scholarship committee. Mm -hmm. I saw in the chat, um, you know, mention of a Dean's Award. So we have some different named awards, you know, mm -hmm. the Dean's Scholarship, the Reed Frost Scholarship, um, you know, et cetera. And so those are all just uh, reviewed. That's based on review by the MPH Scholarship Committee. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of navigating some of the other resources, including there are ways in which students might apply for U.S. loans without mm -hmm. a co-signer. Okay. And there is a way to go through the financial aid page, but there are um, certainly people who can be... Um, it can be addressed. The first way is that there is a little bot, you know, sort of a, you know, can I help you? And they can mm -hmm. direct you often <laughs> to the um, the actual link for these different types of things, such as public health grant or no cosigner, you know, loan. But then um, there are contacts, you know, under financial aid, it will say contact this individual, and they would be also help, you know, willing to help navigate because it can seem like a big it can seem like a big mess in terms of a lot of information on a website. Yeah. But if you have a person, explain it. And so just be sure to find the contact on the website and somebody would get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the, for, uh, I know the program is, ex is extremely short and it's fast paced. Um, so what opportunities are there for students who who would want to get a hands-on experience or yes. real-world public health experience whilst doing their MPH program? Is, is such opportunities available at Hopkins? Yes. And so, you know, um, as Dr. Banda is saying, it is intense. And that's because everybody has several years of experience coming into this program. They actually hit the ground running when they start the program. And I, teaching biostatistics, can actually see students, you know, I, not that I'm seeing light bulbs go on, but I you know students have come up to me after class and they say, well, now I know why this method was used. Now I know why, you know, yeah. how I mm -hmm. interpret this. And I think that's true of all classes. So although it's five eight week terms and that go across 11 months, it, it is doable. I think that students learn a lot, but in um, addition, they have the time to do a work with an agency for their practicum experience. Mm -hmm. And they also have time, many students work 10 hours a week as a research assistant with yeah. a, an investigator and a team. And so that really is you know, um, applied public health experience in the context of that, you know, 11 month period. Yeah. So every student that I've seen that, that has wanted to get an RA position has been able to do so. Um, in early June, I send out an email to all of my faculty colleagues saying there's a bright new group of MPH students coming. Do you have any RA positions? And we okay. post those. So, um, so the faculty and teams, you know, teamwork is a really important part of this for most students. Yes, yes, and and for for students who 
who are looking for array positions, I, I always tell them to keep looking because there are several opportunities available. Uh, faculties are looking out for students to fill some of, of their projects. Uh, so if, if, you, if you're only interested and you reach out, you likely um, get options to, to help, uh, you know, apply the knowledge that you're getting from, from the program. Um, still, so still with the international students, for for some people, I know it's a, it's it's become extremely difficult uh, to get visas uh, once they've gotten their their I twenties. Um, are there any options for international students who, for example, are uh, anxious about the start date of the program, even when they don't have their visas yet? So great question. And I think, you know, um, an example was last summer was a, you know, last spring and summer in 2022 uh, was difficult because the pandemic was an ending, if you will, the mm -hmm. pandemic was winding down at that time. And there were long queues for visas because so many were in the queue from several years, you know, before. I'm hopeful that this um, problem will not be as great um, you know, this year. But what um, the best advice I can give is that our Office of International Services reaches out to an individual international student after they accept our offer of admission. And they usually recommend about three months um, in terms of then, you know, getting a, um, a visa appointment and getting it processed. Um, we have, though, um, in certain situations, we have had full-time students start online. Mm -hmm. So they've started um, for the eight-week summer term, which is yeah. July and August online. And, and for a number of students last year, that gave them enough time to get the visa appointment, visa. the visa, and then to join us in September. And then their four terms, four consecutive full-time terms, were from September through um, May which allows them to qualify for OPT. Okay. Afterwards. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, as, as you've all heard, uh, if you're struggling with uh, securing visas, first of all, it's, it's, it's very important for you to start the process early, um, work with the International uh, Students' Office. And if, you know, you've tried all options and it's not working, you can actually start your, your, your summer term online and then keep pushing for your visa um so we recommend you mm -hmm. know i don't want to interrupt you but we do recommend that you start early mm -hmm. so that then the possibility is higher right the probability is higher of being able to get the visa by summer um, because we know summer is a really um, important time um, in terms of students networking with each other and really bonding as an mph cohort mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's it's, it's crucial to start early, uh, because as uh, Professor Dinawe said, the summer term it's is the time to meet your colleagues, um, especially now that most of the courses are uh, on site. Um, so for and still on international students, because I'm quite interested in international students. Uh, how does the program ensure that they have like the same? Uh, access to the resources and support on campus, uh, despite the challenges of, for example, starting from their home country? Yes. So if they start from their home country, um, we do pride ourselves on our online courses because our online course development was meant to simulate what you would have on an on-site um, mm -hmm. course. Okay. So we have, you know, many different, um, we have teaching assistants, um, most of the lectures and other activities are asynchronous, so they allow the student to actually do the work when they wish, not at 2 a.m., you know, which might be their time if they were um, um, participating in Baltimore. But I think the combination of the types of um, online courses that have been developed um, really allow students from across the globe, they were intentionally developed to allow students from across the globe to participate, to gain access to both TAs and faculty, and also to each other. So many of our courses have groups working together, and they are put together by time zones, so that if you are in um, Ghana, you're working with others who are in your time zone, as opposed okay. to being 12 hours, you know, difference. Um, 
So that, that's what, how I would answer in terms of online, online. Um, mm-hmm. on site, um, there are there are other resources too. So we do have a course that's called English Writing for Academic Purposes. And so that is available um, in two terms uh, for, um, for students who, for whom English is not their native language. Um, and I do think that there's a little bit of a cultural difference sometimes that uh, international students have to get over. Yes. And that is that they can actually approach their faculty and teaching assistants. So Mm -hmm. no one should be shy about asking questions. That's why the um, teaching assistants and faculty are there. That's their purpose to be able to aid students. And that the same can be said for online instruction. Online. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, I I, I know that there are several resources for international students uh, to, to get really used to the system. So uh, you wouldn't. No. Mm-hmm. no, and you you know what? I'm sorry, Bundy. I forgot the most important thing is that we do have an international student um, information day before mm-hmm. orientation, mm-hmm. and it's a wonderful session because it's led by students like Dr. Banda who yeah. went through the program and can share tips about mm-hmm. getting used to the academic environment, but also where to go to buy, you know, your favorite foods or yeah. to get a cell phone or get a driver's license. Yes, so, yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you. Well. Um, and I think one of the questions that I, I keep uh, getting that perhaps I would love for you to, to uh, share thoughts on is that people feel uh, prospective students feel that most schools that are offering MPH are categorized under STEM. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you come to Hopkins, it's not regarded as a STEM, even if you're doing uh, epibiocide concentration. Uh, are there any options to, to change that or is it still going to be like that? <laughs> so we actually have made progress. So um, what we have done is actually gone through the procedures that are required for changing the code of okay. our um, of our school to allow it to to show that actually the numbers of credits in particular areas meets the fraction of what are considered to be STEM qualified mm-hmm. courses, mm-hmm. and that was submitted to the Maryland Higher Education Commission, and I'm hope to have uh, news that I can share very very soon. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you so much. To uh, an exciting to to know that you. I mean, you're you're working on this. Um. So keep your fingers crossed. We may have some news very soon. Um. We would like to take some questions. Uh. From the from the audience. I know most of them like we've we've answered it indirectly, but I would love us to to take to look at a few of them. Um. We have a question from Martin. Uh, so Martin says, hello, Dr. Banda. I'm from South Sudan. I have a bachelor's of pharmacy. Uh, I have been a Red Cross volunteer for seven years where we supported a community responsive to disasters. Work to UNICEF. Okay. So um, I don't think... Mm-hmm. He doesn't have a question, but um, <laughs> one of the questions you asked me previously, I should mention that there is on our website... A, um, the MPH website, a link to something called the Peter Salama Scholarship. And that scholarship is restricted to those from different countries, okay. but South Sudan is one of them. So okay. I'd encourage um, I'd encourage you to, you don't need to apply, but that is something that you would be considered for simply because you're from um, South Sudan. South Sudan, okay. Yeah. So Martin, I guess um, you just wanted to show us your credentials. I think you you are good. You can apply, um, and there are specific you know scholarship designed for students from uh, from South Sudan. Um, we'll take another question from Michael. Uh, Michael says, "Hey, Doctor Banda, does the school have an online MPH which can potentially be funded?" Yeah, so we have a um, um, part-time online program that can be done completely online and um, and anywhere up to four years as a maximum. But in terms of funding, 
our funding is not as um, strong internally for our part-time program as it is for our full-time program. And that's because um, most part-time students are working at the same time. So they you know, have a source of income, but sometimes depending on the employer, they might actually pay for some of the tuition as well. Okay. Okay. So um, Michael uh, or Michelle, I hope you've you've gotten the the, the response. Um, we'll take one on Facebook. Uh, this is from. Uh, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name well. Chijundi. Uh, he says hi, Doctor Banda. I saw, I saw, mention of a dean's award for MPH students with a good academic performance. Can we get a highlight on what this entails? Great. So, you know, as I was mentioning with the scholarships that are awarded by our MPH scholarship committee, they have different names. And so the Dean's scholarship is approximately a 25% scholarship. Um, we have others with different names, but the what it in, entails is that all of your credentials in an application are reviewed by the scholarship committee. And they have the very difficult task of trying to separate out, you know, and assign different awards. But that is uh, that is just one of the different kinds of awards that are given out. Okay, uh, thank you for and that. And it's for tuition. It's for tuition only. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, um, Chijundi, uh, you've as uh, as you've rightly had. Uh, so the dean scholarship is mainly for tuition and. Uh, it's the same process. They 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 rank students and award uh, to those who meet uh, those criteria. Um, we'll take some questions uh, from. Okay, let's take this from Joel. Joel wants to know what is the structure of the thesis of the Johns Hopkins MPH program. Uh, oh yeah, thank you for that question. So it's actually a paper. So we call it the MPH capstone project, and it can take very many um, formats, um, but it's on the order of 20 pages or so. It's not 200 pages, it's not a thesis, <laughs> but it should be a paper that is uh, revolving around something you wouldn't have been able to do without developing your new MPH skills. Mm -hmm. It's under a one-on-one -on -one mentoring from a capstone advisor, a faculty advisor or mentor. And it can range from being a data analysis um, of a research question written up as a research report uh, and then hopefully subsequently published. It can be a grant proposal, mm -hmm. a program evaluation, um, a, a uh, any number of things or a combination yeah. of those. So it's quite broad, but it is meant to be for you to identify what you'd like to accomplish with new skills and do it in a mentored set mm -hmm. setting. Okay, thank you. Joel, I hope you, you have uh, your answer. I'm, I'm letting Professor Marudina West answer all these questions uh, so that I wouldn't have to repeat myself. <laughs> again so this is from o obed from facebook uh he's asking if the program is open for nurses open for nurses Nurses. oh nurse. nurses of yeah. course of course yes so we do require that a nurse have um two years of health related experience as a nurse but it, it um but a pharmacist, so we had a question earlier regarding someone with a bachelor of pharmacy. So having that with two years of experience does qualify you. And I would say that we have probably about 40% of our student body are physicians, pharmacists, nurses, medical students, um, veterinarians, you know, so, and then the other 60% are, you know, are coming from different, uh, different backgrounds. But, um, Maybe I should go ahead and, and answer all, um, Haji's question about the basic qualifications for students, again, to enroll in the MPH. Mm -hmm. So it is the two years of health-related experience, unless you have a, an MD or a PhD already. Um, it requires having some quantitative experience on your transcript. We, um, we, we often have to look at physicians and sort of see that that's in the preventive medicine or community medicine um, yes. you know, course. 
um, but also then have biology and a health related science um, course. So those are the basic qualifications along with um, having a great personal statement and great letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. is, is there a hard stop or is there a hard cutoff point for a GPA? There, there is not. There is not a hard cutoff point for a, you know, a grade point average. But, um, but you know, what we do want to see if somebody has had difficult grades, say, in mm -hmm. the beginning of their studies and they've improved, that is looked upon favorably as opposed to having good grades and then decrease, decrease. over mm -hmm. time is not looked upon as favorably. Okay. All right. So, and we um, do not require GREs. We do not require <laughs> standardized test scores. Okay, so yeah, so that we don't require GREs. Uh, how about IL like language proficiency tests? We do require either the TOEFL or the IELTS or Duolingo. There are some other, you know, another uh, test too that whose name I forget. But we do require English language proficiency tests unless the student's um, language of instruction in the, at their school was English. English, okay. Okay, and so no, if no test is required. Okay, great. So if you're a student from um, uh, an English speaking country, for for example, like Ghana or Nigeria, uh, where English is a primary uh, medium of uh, communication or teaching, then uh, you may not need to write any language proficiency tests, right? That's correct. Okay. That would be waived. Okay, all right. So uh, you don't have ILT to worry about, you don't have. Um, uh, GRE to worry about. Uh, if if your GPA is not uh, in in the first class range, and you know it, it shows improvements in your progress, you can you can you are still a good candidate to apply. Um, let's take one question from uh, YouTube. This is from uh, Mulukin. Uh, it says that. Uh, it's a great honor to attend this event, and we are fortunate to have Professor Dina West. Yes. Uh, what are the names of international internal scholarships provided for MPH and the amount of funding? Uh, I think this is a very loaded question. I, I maybe yeah, you can just highlight you know, a few. <laughs> So, Mulukan, this is this is um, a little bit of a difficult question because we do have some internal MPH funds that we um, give names to. Deans, Reed Frost, those were two chairs of epidemiology and biostatistics in the past, and they really are just honorific uh, funding. Um, that these are partial funding. The only one that really has full funding is the Somer Scholarship for tuition as well as stipend, the Peter Salama Scholarship for one scholarship for full tuition. And then we have some endowed scholarships that come from donors who mm -hmm. actually then we give their names so that the, um, the recipient can acknowledge in the future the family of the, the donor. Um, but all of these decisions are based on the MPH Scholarship Committee's decisions. Okay. They make the awards. Yeah. So, um, Mulukin, as you've heard, there are several internal scholarships with different names, and <laughs> and um, I mean, it's whatever you award that is, is is dependent on the decision that the the scholarship committee arrives at. So that is that. I think we've answered the the, the uh, some of the questions already from Popula. We've answered. Um, um, well, Popula has a new question, and um, and and I think Joel asked as well about um, PhD students and yes. funding. And I would love to to describe that because our school made a big change um, several years ago, mm -hmm. in which um, the number of PhD students is smaller in each department than it was say five or 10 years ago, but each student gets full tuition funding, each PhD student. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and that's true of each of the 10 departments in okay. our school. Now the requirements may require a GRE depending on the program. It may require um, sometimes personal interviews. So they may have different requirements, but the good news is if, if you get selected, you're, tuition funding is covered. Okay. 
th- thank you so much for for highlighting for highlighting that. Yes, uh, if if you are a PhD applicant, um, uh, once you get in, uh, I think you're guaranteed of uh, full full funding. Uh, so that shouldn't be a, a problem. And I think some departments also offer some uh stipend support uh for at least two years i know of epidemiology department um so uh, thank you so much for for that response i think we'll take a couple more from linkedin uh and then would we'll call it a day so uh question from parisa parisa wants to know whether you need to contact a potential supervisor before applying for the MPH program? Oh, excellent question. You do not. And so we try to make this um, easy, Parisa, in terms of um, when a full-time student starts, they actually are matched with a member of our faculty MPH executive board um, for the summer term, along with a group of other students who have similar interests. So they Mm -hmm. first have a summer advisor then they have an academic advisor, and then they get to choose their capstone, you know, mentor for their accumulating, um, culminating capstone project. So I like to think that each MPH student actually has a, um, a team of advisors, starting with the summer, academic, you know, as well as capstone. So I would recommend looking at faculty websites, you know, so that you can approach um, faculty to discuss, you know, both their research, maybe an RA position or capstone in the future, but it's best to wait to contact those faculty members um, um, and we will make the assignment of the summer advisor for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. So as as you've rightly heard, you don't have to identify uh, an advisor before you, you enroll in the MPH program. Um, question from... Oluwa Ferami, uh, is the MPH program open for biochemists? Uh, well, so yes, yes, I think so. So, um, so if you have a bachelor's degree, for example, in you know biochemistry, and you um, have a biology course and a health-related science course and you know math course, which you probably do, then the um, the real issue would be the two years of health related experience so that could be maybe you're working in a pharmaceutical company as a biochemist or you're you're you know using your skills in some other health related way then you would be eligible with those two years of health related experience okay so um as you've rightly had it it's it, the program is open to literally everybody who can show uh the basic requirements of sat in class with journalists, lawyers, um, all sort of all sort of people with different backgrounds. So yes, you can apply. Um, to we'll take a couple more from LinkedIn. Uh, let's see, okay. So somebody's asking from Martin, uh, what kind of recommendation letters are required? Mm. Yes. So thank you, Martin. So we require um, three, at least three, but typically it's three letters of recommendation. We like to see a mix of academic letters, meaning written, say, at least one letter written by a previous professor who you worked with, you know, in your training, and then also professional letters. So these would be supervisors, you know, Mm -hmm. um, in your current positions. So with those letters, um, it is important that they they know something about you. And so I often recommend that a prospective um, student share their personal statement with the person who's going to write the letter, as well as, um, you know, maybe um, also their their resume so that there's a discussion that you have with a letter writer so that they know what you've been doing since you may have last interacted with them and also what your goals are for the future. So the best letters are written by people who know something about you, who know <laughs> your strengths, who know your skills. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we'll take we'll take our last question from YouTube, as from Emmanuel. Okay. Uh, so Emmanuel says, "Thank you so much for everything you do for prospective applicants. Um, it's really nice having Professor Dina West with us. Do students have opportunities for graduate?" assistantships and when? 
So great question, Emmanuel. We have different, so many synonyms for the same thing. So when we say research assistant, we really mean a graduate you know, assistant um, or a graduate research assistant. So those um, opportunities that might be working either on a research project or possibly working on a practice project. So it might be working in the community, you know, on a, on a project. Those are um, available um, in the summer term. So, you know, if you really see somebody you want to work with, you know, you could email them, but usually, you know, the, um, we post the uh, descriptions of their available um, research assistantships, and you would then look through um, these listings and contact the faculty, you know, after you arrive um, in July. So that's more efficient than trying to line up something in advance, because mm -hmm. actually, when you think about it, we're in January right now, yeah. there are going to be very different, you know, research and, and practice opportunities available in the summer. Yes, summer. Okay, that's true. So, Emmanuel, um, there are several opportunities, and I, for one, I was, uh, I was working with two different departments. Uh, Department of EPI and uh, Health Policy and Management. And I started my assistantship position uh, just after summertime. Uh, so, I mean, the summertime is not really recommended because you are now getting used to the system, getting to know your colleagues, and it's time for, for networking and all that. But you can subsequently uh, start searching. Um, okay, so Martin wants to know academic or professional recommendation uh, for? So yeah, so Martin, in terms of three recommendations, it could be two academic and one professional or one academic and two professional. You can mix and match, but we mm -hmm. usually like to see at least one you know, from each of those. No, no relatives, no clergy <laughs> friends, you know, no, <laughs> no, um, you know, so no, no spouses, you know, so it should be somebody who, you know, knows you from an academic or professional. <laughs> okay. So as, as if I don't bring recommendation letters from your uncles and, and family members. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Or uh, old family friends, right? Mm -hmm. no, none of those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think our time is almost up. Um, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your time and uh, accepting this invitation to share your wisdom with us, um, your advice and you, you, the information you've provided and your experience will be very, very invaluable. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for our prospective applicants and those who have already gained admission to Hopkins? Yeah, so, um, so my advice would be for those who are working um, for admission, you know, and have maybe have not heard yet or have heard and are still trying to find funding that we will be having a number of uh, virtual events in addition to the um, the school MPH admitted students day, which one will be virtual and one will be on site. But these will be um, in if you've uh, applied, they will be in your portal and we'll look forward to seeing you then and have breakout rooms and you'll be able to talk to um, MPH program office staff and probably will bring in the OI, the Office of International Services and possibly financial aid into one of those as well. And for those of you who are thinking about applying, the next cycle actually starts in the middle of August mm -hmm. with a deadline of December 1st for, um, for the full-time program in 2024. Okay. And um, Jagrup said, what about the cover letter for PhD programs in the UK? I really don't know um, <laughs> to get external scholarship for graduate because funding is not available. I don't know so much, sorry, about um, external scholarships in the UK, but I would look at, um, I would do a Google search. It's amazing what you can find sometimes on scholarships. Yes. You could say, you know, scholarship for someone from um, a certain country to, you know, study in the UK, graduate study in the UK. And, um, and that might allow you to identify some of these external scholarships. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Professor Marjina West, for joining us today. Um, we, re we really, really appreciate, we really appreciate your time and insight with us. Um, well, it's uh, been my pleasure. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Banda. It's so good to see you. Yeah, and good so to nice you. to have the opportunity to interact with all of you, um, 
you know, via this medium. So yeah, thanks sure. so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>